Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Kimberly Arkand and I am zooming to you virtually from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory Control Center. Today we also have with us Krista Devona who will be doing the second part of the tour, guiding you through some educational activities. At any point today, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in a chat. But first, we would like to start off by asking you all a question. So if we could launch our first poll today, we would like to know what kind of space science interests you. So if you could be a space scientist, which would you most like to be at this point in time? Would you like to be an astronomer, an astronaut, a planetary geologist, or an aerospace engineer? So go ahead and fill out the results of the poll. And um, again, there are many, many more career opportunities than that, but we've just picked a few to sort of start our day off with. And it looks like so far, everybody wants to be an aerospace engineer. So doing things like operating vehicles on different planetary surfaces, for example. And I see some other coming in for planetary geologist, also an excellent choice. Um, these look really great. So we're gonna go ahead and share the results of the poll as we move on. All right, so I'd like to talk just very briefly about my own background. I actually started out in molecular biology. I was studying things under a microscope and then I sort of realized that I did not want to study under a microscope for my whole career. So I moved into computer science and it was towards the end of my undergraduate work when I was in college that I realized this and I sort of scrambled to get some computer coding classes under my belt. But I really found that for me, computer science was just a way to tell stories with data. And that idea of combining science and computer science was essentially like a, a key that unlocked the universe. And that combination landed me here at NASA's Chandrax Observatory, working at the Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so today I get to do data visualization, image research, work in virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing, and a whole lot more. So let's go to our next slide. Okay. Okay, so Chandra is one of NASA's great observatories and it was launched back in 1999 during a beautiful night launch. We're gonna hear a special message just for you from Colonel Eileen Collins. She was the first woman to command a NASA space shuttle mission. And here is what launch was like for her. I'm Eileen Collins, commander of space shuttle mission STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23rd, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators. We did standalone simulators with our training team, and we also did joint integrated simulations. Leading up to the launch, my crew was very confident that we were totally trained and ready to go. We weren't nervous. We were just primarily focused on doing the best job that we could. That summer, we had two launch delays. The first one on July 20th was due to a problem on the space shuttle. And then the second launch delay was two days later. And that was due to thunderstorms in the launch area. But we were happy to finally get the launch off on the third attempt, about the third time that the crew had uh, strapped in to the shuttle. People often ask me, what does it feel like to be in a space shuttle launch. It sounds like you're in a room that's on fire as you've got the boosters and the engines burning around you in what we call a controlled explosion. There's so much shaking in first stage when you're on the solid rocket boosters that if you try to write, you would not be able to read afterwards what you wrote. We had a successful launch and we were able to proceed with procedures to get Chandra on its way on flight day one. So looking back, it was a perfect deployment our crew watched the Chandra float away. We took our final photos and our final videos. As we watched Chandra float away, it seemed like it was almost like a sailboat on a calm sea. We knew that no one would ever see the Chandra again, but that we would still feel its presence as it continued to send its data and its information to Earth for many years to come. I really love how Eileen describes that whole process. It was a relatively um, exciting mission, 
the Chandra's XR Observatory is about the size of a school bus. And so it was the heaviest payload that the space shuttle had ever carried up into space, which made it more of a dangerous mission than a lighter payload would give you, just because all of that heaviness means that if there's something that goes wrong during the launch or during that early part of the mission, deployment is essentially, or I should say, the ability to abort is really difficult. And so they did a lot of training to be able to make sure they would handle everything for Chandra very safely and every keep all of the crew safe. And it was just a really fantastic effort from all the people on ground and of course the astronauts doing the hard work up in space. So let's learn a little bit more here with Dr. Belinda Wilkes, who is the previous director for Chandra. She um, retired from directorship about a year ago. And here is what she had to say about what launching Chandra from her perspective on Earth was like. Less than one minute away now from the 95th spatial launch. 35 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. When Chandra went up on the shuttle, so the shuttle basically lit up the sky like daylight for a couple of minutes as it went up and the ground underneath our feet shook. Five, four, three. We have a go for engine start, zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. We were two or three miles away. So it's just an amazing feeling of, of the power that is needed to escape the Earth's gravitational pull, which we needed to do to get in orbit. And also amazing to think that mankind can actually do this. It's very um, satisfying and exciting to see the results of all the years and all the people who've worked on Chandra and finally it goes up. So very exciting from the ground as well. Not quite as exciting as going up into space, but I think you can see already the different types of careers that are necessary to help run and launch and work on a NASA space mission. So Chandra, as I mentioned, is about the size of a school bus. It goes about a third of the way to the moon at its farthest point from Earth. What that means is that Chandra had to work perfectly because it was going too far to be able to be worked on by astronauts in the future if something broke down or something wasn't working right. So in order to take Chandra to the doctor, essentially, we do that through code. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, what does Chandra get to look at? It gets to look at really hot and energetic areas of our universe, things like exploding stars, things like areas around black holes. Chandra's been considered a black hole hunter, things like merging galaxies, also things like young stars, baby stars, maturing stars, all sorts of really interesting cosmic objects. So really one of the important things about Chandra is that it fits into this larger picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. Essentially, our universe emits all different kinds of light from radio waves all the way up to gamma rays. And it's really important to have many different kinds of light to be able to study the universe. Because if we only looked at a very small sliver of light, say optical light or what human eyes can detect, it'd be like only able to see down the the foul base, the third baseline um, on a baseball field, or like only be able, being able to play middle C in a couple keys on either side on a, on a piano keyboard, right? It would be a limited perspective that we would have. But when you combine it with many different kinds of light, we get much more information. So let's go ahead and launch our next poll. I'd like to learn exactly what kinds of light you're familiar with, or perhaps what you have interacted with here on Earth. So go ahead and pick a favorite kind of light that you have either used or interacted with in your own life. That might be infrared, it might be ultraviolet, it might be x-rays, my own personal favorite, or it might be visible light. So, so far we've got folks that have been interacting with ultraviolet light, which is brilliant, yes, because we're all interacting with ultraviolet light from the sun, for example. If you've ever had to put sunscreen on your skin to protect yourself from that ultraviolet radiation. 
And I see that folks are also selecting visible light, which is the type of light that human eyes can detect. Very important, of course, for us to be able to navigate the world around us. I see no one has put in x-rays which makes me a little sad, but that's okay. So I think the idea here is to talk about that all of these different kinds of light offer us a different opportunity or a different tool to be able to understand things around us, whether that's here on earth or whether that's out in the universe at large. So we can go ahead and finish sharing those results and then I will quit out of the poll. Great. So. Again, you might be familiar with x-rays if you've ever gone to say the dentist or the doctor and they're using machine to direct x-ray light down at say your hand if you fractured it or at a tooth if you have a cavity. And it's able to see through your skin and tissue down to the bone or able to see down towards the inner parts of your teeth to be able to understand what's going on. All of these different kinds of light just give us another you know, tool in our toolbox, so to speak, when we're trying to understand say something in the universe. And so we're going to look at one object in many different kinds of light now just to help give you a sense of things. And the object that we're looking at is the M51 galaxy, which is a sister spiral galaxy a little farther out away from us. It's about 50 million light years away. And if we look at that object in X-ray light, we're seeing all of this hot energetic material, things like black holes, things like exploding stars, things like neutron stars and X-ray binaries, which are things sort of dancing in pairs. If we look at ultraviolet radiation, we're looking at all of these stars that are emitting a lot of kind of UV light. And then if we look at it in optical and or infrared, radiation, now we're looking at like cooler dust lanes of gas and stars where stars are forming. And it's just really interesting if you look at all of these different kinds of light individually, and then you combine them into one picture, you can really see how it helps give you a better sense of this galaxy, right? This huge conglomeration of stars and gas and dust all held together by gravity. And there's a tiny little uh, baby galaxy at the top that that larger spiral shaped galaxy is interacting with. So again, it's like having different tools in the toolbox for any astronomer to be able to figure out the answers to the question that he or she is asking. So we're gonna take just a minute to look at some of my favorite objects in the universe. As I mentioned, Chandra looks at all different kinds of things. Most of the images we're gonna see include Chandra X-ray data as well as other NASA data too. So this, for example, is a little area of star formation. It's like a stellar nursery. There are little baby stars inside these tall pillars of gas and dust or clusters of young stars. Young stars kind of like to hang out and party together. And this is essentially a cluster of those young stars as they're starting to mature. We can look at more mature stars that might be on their way to exploding, for example, um, perhaps in the next 50 years or perhaps not for another like 50,000 years. We can look at stars that are pairs that are just dancing together and causing this beautiful kind of nebulous material to be expanding around them. We can look at stars that are kind of like our sun and show us a glimpse of what our sun might be like in say five billion years or so as it starts to puff off some of those outer layers. We can look at stars that have exploded themselves to smithereens. We can look at areas around black holes like the very supermassive black hole at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. We can look at galaxies of all shapes and sizes, galaxies that are interacting and galaxies that are just kind of on their own doing their own thing. And we can even look at clusters of galaxies, which are tens, if not hundreds, and sometimes thousands of these galaxies all enveloped in clouds of hot gas, some of which even look like they're smiling back at us thanks to gravitational lensing. So as you can see, there's a lot of different objects that Chander gets to look at. We're going to take one more poll. So we can go ahead and launch poll number three, I believe this is. We're going to talk one more time about light. And we'll ask you, which of these lights does not belong? Okay, here's the question. Which is not a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we've been talking so far about this morning? Is it gamma rays? Is it burst rays? Is it X-rays or is it visible light? And I already see most of the answers are in already. And yes, I see that correct answer is coming through. I'll give you just another second to put in your answer before we move on. But indeed, the second option 
there we are. <laughs> Second option is not right. There are no burst arrays in the electromagnetic spectrum. Many thanks for filling out the polls. Let's go ahead and move on. So Chandra has traveled over 3 billion kilometers since it was launched in 1999, exploring our high energy universe. It's taken over 3000 trips around our planet. It's collected over 25 trillion bytes of data, and it has taken more than 4 million lines of code in order to operate Chandra, in order to collect Chandra data, and in order to analyze that really awesome Chandra data. So really computer science is a critical workhorse for making sure Chandra operates smoothly. So I'd like to just move over to Sabina Hurley right now. She is our flight operations team program manager at the Chandra Control Center, which is what my background here is from. And she's gonna talk a little bit about how very special Chandra is. They knew the science that they wanted to do, the technology to do it didn't actually exist. Countless engineers had to solve a whole host of problems to get Chandra on orbit. The mirrors on Chandra, those mirrors had to be smooth to the level of a couple of atoms. You're skipping photons, so they need to be atomically smooth. And they have to be really delicately aligned because you need all eight mirrors to be working together. And they are now focusing on an instrument, and the instrument chips are only four inches square and you have to hit that four inch square every single time. And that's not actually good enough. That would just give you a blob. So to get the imaging you want, the resolution you want, you have to hit exactly the same spot on that four inch square every time. And the spot you have to hit is less than the diameter of a human hair, 10 meters away. Then you have to do this on Earth, but it's going to operate in zero G. So you need to figure out how can I align these so that they'll be aligned on Earth for testing. But then when it's up in space, it has to stay aligned. You can't go up and fix it. So how do I build all the structure around it so that they stay aligned so precisely through all of that? So once you've done that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of those mirrors to within fractions of a degree. But you're in space. It's a harsh environment. The engineering and the level of testing and trying and retrying and testing to get just the mirrors right is absolutely mind blowing. I think Sabina puts it really well. The amount of people, the amount of engineers, technologists, scientists, administrators that it took in order to build Chandra was really incredible. And it's still just a technological marvel even over 20 years later. So there is a VR tour that you can launch on smartphones or in your browser. If you go to chandra.si.edu slash VR slash chandra underscore VR. I think Kristen will also put that URL in the chat. Um, some of the feedback from our last uh, dozen or so times that we've done this field trip was that they would like to get more time for Q&A. So we're gonna leave that first virtual tour for you to do on your own time after our conversation today. But next, let's go ahead and jump into the Chander Operations Control Center tour. This will give you a sort of um, backstage pass at what happens to actually take care of Chandra. Uh, in order for Chandra to do its job day in and day out. So this is the sort of welcome area for the Chandra Control Center in Burlington, Massachusetts. When you first walk out of the elevator, you have a little sort of meeting and welcome area right here. Um, you can see in the back of the building, there is not only some lovely meeting space with a view, but if you turn around, there is a small version of the Chandra spacecraft. Um, this spacecraft was built very in a very detailed way. It's a 10% size of the actual Chandra spacecraft. Remember, Chandra is about the size of the school bus. And you can see some Chandra images behind it. And then right here on the wall, there is actually a little banner that actually flew up into the space shuttle during the STS-93 mission, mission, which launched Chandra. And the astronauts took like photos and did some press ops in front of that and then brought it back down here to Earth in order for us to be able to have a little memento from that STS-93 mission. I thought that was pretty cool of them. So now we're gonna head down to the control center, this first hallway on our right. 
Over here on the left is sort of a timeline, if you will, a little mini exhibit. Um, Kristen did most of this work here, designing it. And you can, if you wanna go back into this tour at your own time, get some of the details on how Chandra went from being an idea in the 1960s to being launched in the 1990s and sort of what that took, some of the technological components of Chandra, um, the various types of instruments on board and what that was like. We're gonna head inside the control center here. This is usually the most fun part of the control center. You can see there are a few banks of these computer consoles. This is where people would be sitting on any given day. During the pandemic, Chandra was continuously operated and it never had a break in its operations, but they did absolutely put safety and control measures in place to keep all of the operations crew and staff um, healthy and safe during the pandemic. Some of those restrictions have started to, to lift as the numbers in Massachusetts at least are going down. But it has been definitely an interesting journey after 20 years of operating a spacecraft um, to be doing so during a pandemic. And you can see here on the left, there is this first bank of computers. This is where the command controller sits. Um, all the commands that are going up to Chandra originate from this console. So everything is triple checked, quadruple checked before that happens to make sure Chandra's commands are on point. On the right side is where the lead spacecraft console is. That's where the lead spacecraft engineer sits. And that person is making sure to, to do all of the sort of non-routine real-time activities and coordinating everything that Chandra is going to be pointing towards and looking at. And we can go down the middle of the aisle here and there are two more rows of uh, computer consoles. This first row right in front of us here, this is where the spacecraft subsystem engineers sit. So making sure that all of the different pieces on the spacecraft that have to operation um, operate functionally are able to do so from that set of computer consoles. And then right up here in the front, this is where the science instrument team sit. There are two main instruments on board Chandra plus its gratings. And these folks right here on the left and the right of this um, uppermost row, they're able to make sure everything is operating beautifully. Then finally at the very back of the room, you can see there are a ton of different monitors to look at. Let's see if we can get a little closer. So Chandra talks to NASA's deep space network in order to get its commands, to get its you know job listings for the day, if you will. And it's also gonna talk to the deep space network in order to send back all of the data that it's collected. So this is just showing you whether it's talking to the deep space network or who else the deep space network is talking to. That happens for Chandra about every eight hours. You can see where Chandra is located in um, position with the earth over here on the left screen. And then right up here on the top, you can see that there are a whole bunch of little green squares. All those re green squares are essentially telling you that things are good on board Chandra. So it's, it's location's good, it's temperature's good. Like when we're taking Chandra to the doctor, this is kind of like all of its vital statistics, if you will. And if you see any of those little boxes go red, that's gonna tell you that there might be a problem to investigate. So if the temperature is an issue or if there's something wrong with it, those boxes will essentially help let us know they're sort of some of the clues that we would have in order to fix Chandra or to do something to be able to make Chandra work better. And so all of these screens that they're looking at are really important to be able to understand whether Chandra is functioning healthily and beautifully. And that is the bulk of the control center. I'll just show one last thing up here in the back left corner. Uh, of course, all of our flight engineers and operations control folks down here on the ground um, are people just like us and they have different interests and skills. And you can see that uh, one of our controllers is a little artist and likes to keep kind of things fresh over in the corner, a little cheerleading sort of section that says, keep it up, Chander Ops. And I, I think that's a pun to make sure you keep Chandra up in space. So that is what our control center looks like. We can go back out here. If at any point you can go back into the, um, the virtual tour and sort of learn more about the various pieces. There's, for example, a room where folks can sleep in case there is a blizzard like we've 
had <laughs> this winter here um, or other kinds of bad weather or other issues going around, the crew is able to stay in sleepover. So they're always safe and always able to make sure um, Chandra is operating beautifully. So as I sort of mentioned a little bit during that virtual tour, the way we operate Chandra is sending up commands through NASA's deep space network. So there is an object in the universe that we want to study because scientists have asked for time to study that object. Maybe it's an exploded star like we're seeing here in this video. The photons or those packets of energy from that object have been traveling to us for some time for thousands, if not millions or billions of light years. Um, now a light year is essentially the distance that light travels in a year, which is about 10 trillion kilometers. So if you have an object that's about 10,000 light years away, that light has had to travel quite a way in order to get to us. So 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. So Chandra is pointed towards that object, that information sort of comes down through Chandra's mirrors. It sort of skips along the mirrors, like how you might skip a stone across a pond. And then all of that information is collected at the science instruments way down at the base. Then it's packaged up into a suitcase of binary code, ones and zeros. And those ones and zeros are sent down through NASA's deep space network about every eight hours before eventually they go to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And then finally, the control center in Massachusetts before making their way to perhaps my laptop here in Rhode Island. After that, we kind of do the unpacking. So we're using lots of different kinds of coding and software to be able to unpack all that information. So we move from those ones and zeros, that binary code, which is just essentially a system of talking to machines, right? So telescopes in space like Chandra, as well as many other kinds of electronic devices use binary code as a way of communicating because those electronic devices are electronic, they've got those essential, you know, systems of going on or off, just like electricity, it functions in those two states on or off. So binary code is a great way to be able to talk to machines. So after we unpack that binary code, the data is then formulated into a table, the table that tells us the time, the location and the energy of each little photon, each little pixel that we're going to make into an image, for example. And then we use more coding and more software to be able to create the visual representation of an object. So this right here that we're looking at now is the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A. This is an exploded star or what happens when a star that's many times more the size of our sun, at least eight or so times the mass of our sun, it starts to run out of fuel. It sort of collapses in on itself and then it explodes its guts out all over the universe. This is what a quick look image of that visual representation would be like. And then when we get more data, when we process the data, we can then slowly start to build up the information to be able to create a colorized representation. So this object, Cassiopeia A, is about 10,000 light years away from us. So a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. So 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. And this is just one hour of time from the telescope for the object that we're looking at now. When we look at an object like Cassiopeia A for a long time, we can collect millions of seconds of information and we can reveal a really rich and detailed map of all of that beautiful information that Chandra was able to capture. So in the version that's on my screen now, it's actually been color coded by the type of chemical emission it's kind of like the DNA or the fingerprints of that X-ray light that Chandra has been able to capture. And in this case, we color code it just like you would color code a map that's gonna go on your nightly news or on your weather app, right? If you're gonna get a lot of snow, for example, like we've got here in New England this winter, you might color code it so that your red areas are gonna get the highest amounts of the snow or precipitation, and perhaps the red areas will get a lot less, right? I'm sorry, the blue areas will get a lot less. So kind of here, what we're showing is we've color coded according to the iron, the calcium, the silicon, the sulfur, each has been color coded into a different color so that you can map where it is. The iron, for example, has been color coded purple and you can see very specific pockets of that iron along sort of the outermost parts of that shell that's expanding into outer space. When you have, oh, we're going to take a poll. I forgot we added another poll uh, by popular demand. There, we've been adding more polls into this series. So go ahead and launch poll number four, I believe it is, Kristen. 
And in this case, I think we are asking about light years. So can you tell me what does a light year measure? What distance? Does it measure the distance between the sun and earth, the diameter of the Milky Way, the distance light travels in a year, or the distance around the sun? And it looks like almost everybody has answered with a correct answer that it is indeed the distance that light travels in one year. So we are going to minimize that. All right, wonderful. I hope you're enjoying these polls. I think they're rather fun, or at least everybody else has been thinking they're fun, so we've been adding more. Uh, next, we're gonna look at when we have more coding and more data, we can essentially create a three-dimensional model of an exploded star like Cassiopeia, and that is what this looks like here. We have a whole virtual tour of this object as well. You can go to the link at the bottom of the screen, and I believe Kristen will be popping that in the chat as well. It's smithsonianeducation.org slash interactives slash cast dash a slash safari. And you can take a really nice backstage kind of pass into um, looking at that object in virtual reality on your phone or on your desktop and really kind of exploring it in greater detail. Also, if you're interested, we are running a free uh, educators webinar on this exact virtual reality tour tomorrow. You can go ahead and register for that at the Smithsonian Education website. Um, we'll copy and paste that into the chat as well. And then, of course, when you have even more data, you can take that, use more coding, and create a 3D printable file so that you can hold a version of this exploded star in your hands, although scaled way, 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 way down. Um, in actuality, this object is about 40 million billion times the surface area of our sun and planets. Um, but here, it's only shown at about a six-inch model. And you can do more coding and use more software to be able to take that 3D model into virtual reality. And this is one of my students. She's walking around it and inside it and exploring that exploded star up close and personal. And finally, we can also take it and use more coding and more software and create a version that represents the image through sound. So this is what it sounds like when we sonify, that's what it's called, or translate the image data into sound of this beautiful exploded star. All right, and we're almost to the end of this part of our virtual tour, and then we're going to move into some educational activities. So here is Belinda Wilkes again talking about how important it is to do this kind of observation. We are on this tiny little planet next to a very ordinary star that's in the middle of its life in a fairly normal spiral galaxy in some corner of the universe. And the universe is huge, and there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies and supermassive black holes. And yet we are sitting on this Earth, and we're able to understand at least some of what we're seeing by just looking. So what kind of computer languages does it take to make all of this happen? Well, Chandra is, as I mentioned, uh, over 20 years old at this point. So some of the programming languages that went into making Chandra operate um, are some of older languages or more classic as I like to consider them. And of course, we're using more modern languages now as well when we're doing the data analysis and data visualization uh, as we move into things like virtual reality, for example. So anything from Fortran and Perl to C and C++ down to Python and into Unity scripting, C Sharp, G Code, JavaScript, and a host of other scripting languages as well. So I believe this is our final poll of today's virtual tour. We would like to know if you have tried computer coding before. So go ahead, have you ever tried coding? Go ahead, yes, or perhaps not yet. And it looks like, oh, that was very fast. All right, everyone has. <laughs> that is wonderful. Um, I think coding is a really sort of undersold tool for being able to understand our universe. So thank you for filling out the poll. I hope you found those enjoyable. And I'd like to just wrap up today with a last video from Dr. Daniel Castro a wonderful colleague of mine that's going to sort of explain how much Chandra has learned over its past two decades plus. We didn't know that stars could emit x-rays, for example, on the way they do it. We didn't understand how stars blew up 
we didn't understand black holes in nowhere close to as much detail as we do now. We don't understand the clusters of galaxies that make up the, you know, the web of space-time in the detail that we understand it now. Chandra represents a huge step forward in astronomy in general. All right, so I hope you enjoyed time traveling with me today through our universe. One of the cool things about astronomy is that we have all time traveled to look at these objects because when we're looking at different things from space, essentially all we're getting is a yearbook full of baby pictures instead of a yearbook full of the graduating senior pictures because it's taken light so long to reach us. We're looking at, at all of these objects as they were, not as they are now. So I hope you have all enjoyed time traveling with us as well. I'm going to hand it over to Kristen to lead us through some cool stuff you can try yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm just going to highlight a few activities um, that we have. Um, we won't have time to explore all of them. We have, we have a ton, um, but we'll go through a few that we really, really like. And uh, just a quick note to educators, if you do participate in an hour of code, you'll see that many of these fit really nicely into that. And um, we'll provide you with links for these activities and then other activities uh, in the chat towards the end. So the first activity we're highlighting is called um, Recoloring the Universe. And this is a set of computer-based coding activities. It's a really good one for beginners. Students learn basic coding skills by using real NASA data. This is that main site uh, where you'll find a series of video tutorials, super easy to follow. I'm just going to show you a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so this is a similar interface to Scratch. And with our activity, you'll be able to use code to adjust data from exploded stars and black holes. Um, yeah, so the next activity we wanted to showcase is um, it's a series of projects using Tinkercad. And if you're not familiar with Tinkercad, it's a free 3D modeling online program. This is what the interface looks like. We're not gonna walk you through that today, but um, I'm just going to quickly show you um, what our website looks like. Kim, can, can you see the site or am I back? Yes, I can. Yep, okay, nope, great. it's perfect. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, so with this site, you're going to see different projects ranging from really simple ones like creating an earth moon system, and then you can work your way up to more complicated shapes that um, like supernovas and pulsars. And the third and final activity we are highlighting is called Reach Across the Stars, and this is our free augmented augmented reality app where you can explore stories of women in science. And I'm gonna take you to that site. Um, so there are short stories where you can explore um, just, you know, uh, short, short journeys. And then we have some longer extended journeys where you can ask questions, you can listen to interviews, you can do um, interact with uh, 3D, 360 virtual reality, like this one of Mars. Um, and then I'm just gonna highlight this one, one of our scientists, Christina Hernandez. She's a, um, an instrument engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab for um, the Mars 2020 rover. Being an engineer to me was a game changer. It gives me a platform to speak about things that I'm passionate about, such as science, but it also taught me how to be self-sufficient, how to think about complex problems and find simple solutions, and how to use my ability as a collaborator, as a leader, as a team player to help us answer some of scientists' most difficult questions. 
So um, Kim had earlier talked about um, binary code and what you're seeing here is a chart that shows English language alphabet characters corresponding to ones and zeros. So we wanted you all to take a minute and write your initials in binary code. Um, for instance, my initials are KD. And so my binary code initials would be 01001011, So I'm gonna put that chart back up there. And um, if you want, you can uh, share your binary code initials with your teacher or pop it in our chat. Um, and in the meantime, Kim is still available for taking questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Kristen. I really enjoyed seeing everybody's initials and binary code. So yeah, feel free to put those into chat. Uh, we'll leave this chart up for you to be able to. Thank you, Anika. That's great. <laughs> it really is fun. I don't know why. Um, so go ahead and put questions into the chat as we start to wrap up. Um, I went a little longer than I was hoping to. So hopefully if the, the teachers that are left have time to still have their students ask a few questions, we can certainly take some of those. And again, feel free to have them keep working on their binary code initials while we do that. And I see a first question from Anika. How long is Chandra expected to continue functioning? This is a great question and I hope it continues for a long time. I'm very much still in love with this spacecraft. It's absolutely incredible, all of the scientific information that we've been able to glean, all of that sciencey goodness that's out there in the universe that Chandra has helped us study. And we are hoping to celebrate our 25th anniversary coming up soon, um, but we have the possibility to extend for another five years beyond that if everything is still operating nominally. And fortunately, Chandra was built very, very strategically. All of the technologists and the engineers and the scientists who worked on getting Chandra built took very specific care to make sure there weren't things that Chandra would run out of. And they put in backups of pretty much everything. You sort of, when you're building and engineering something that you're never going to be able to see in person again, that you're never going to be able to service from a shuttle mission, you have to make sure that everything has a backup and everything has a backup plan. And our control team here um, in Massachusetts has really dedicated staff that's really excellent at figuring out all of those puzzle pieces. If something on Chandra is getting perhaps uh, a little bit more difficult to work with, or if something needs to be adjusted due to an eclipse schedule or whatever it is, our ground team really does make sure that they can figure those things out. So um, quite a lot of time and effort goes into keeping Chandra healthy and happy. And we hope that we will make it to 30 years, fingers crossed. So thank you for that excellent question. Are there any other questions in the chat before we wrap up? Thank you, I'm glad you find that incredible. I do too. Um, I don't know when the successor to Chandra will launch. So at, at this point, we're really trying to make sure Chandra stays healthy and functioning for as long as possible, because even though it's over 20 years later, you can't beat Chandra's resolution at this point. It's pretty incredible. I mean, just looking at the detail that we showed today um, in you know one or two exploded stars, and it's really amazing what we've learned and what we've been able to resolve. So. All right, I don't see any other questions, so we can go ahead and finish up for the day. Again, I have also put into chat um, an evaluation form if you would like to see these types of programs continue. It's very helpful for us to know if we're doing a good job or not. I always like hearing if we can improve in areas. If you liked the additional polls, let us know. I think it's kind of fun having them, um, but otherwise, uh, that's it. So yeah, keep looking up. The universe is yours to discover. Thanks all.